Welcome into another episode of Locked On Phillies. And in today's episode, we're going to hand out some awards for the first half of the season. The Phils are on the back half of the Major League Baseball regular season schedule. So who's performed? Who's underperformed? Who's the MVP of the team right now? The Cy Young? There's going to be a lot of fun stuff given out. So we'll get into that on today's episode. You are Locked On Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is Locked On Phillies. I am Connor Thomas, your host, and we come to you live from the Locked On Podcast Network. You may know me from 97.5 The Fanatic on the radio, three years as a credentialed Philadelphia Phillies media member, and uh, happy to be with you for another episode. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribe to the YouTube. If you enjoy the content, that's the number one way to say that you do. You get new notifications when episodes are posted. It costs you nothing to subscribe. So I would appreciate it if you've done that, if you uh, if you do that, if you haven't done that already. And today's episode is brought to you by Tax Network USA. Did you know that it's never too late to resolve your tax issues with the IRS? You don't want to wait. It gets worse when you wait. Reduce your tax debt and get help from a team of licensed tax professionals. Call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on and today we're going to start by giving out some awards for the first half of the season who performed who underperformed uh kind of good and bad of the first 81 games now i know you might say connor the phillies have played 84 games yeah uh i've been meaning to get into this but it just so happened that right before we were supposed to do this show over the weekend the casual series with the Miami Marlins, I thought the Phillies were going to dominate, turned into Bryce Harper getting hurt, Kyle Schwarber getting hurt, uh, like the pitching staff not looking nearly as good as I thought, a, a collapsed loss, a comeback win. It turned into a lot more interesting of a series, but 84 games, 81's the halfway point. We'll call it even, yeah? Then that'll be mine and yours little secret that we did this a little bit into the second half. But I do want to look back and review some things from the first half of this Philly season, especially considering we have an off day today. I'm recording this on Monday. The Phils are in Chicago starting tomorrow night to take on the Cubs. And we're going to talk about whether or not they're heading into a gauntlet stretch of the schedule, a small gauntlet stretch of the schedule. We'll talk about that. But let's get into the awards. And I want to start with the most surprising player of the first half for the Philadelphia Phillies. There are a lot of guys that would be in contention for this. You can look at the bullpen. You could say, mm, I thought Matt Strom was good. I didn't know he was going to be this unbelievably good. Uh, you could look at the starting rotation. You could say, oh, wow, Ranger Suarez. Thought he'd be good. Didn't think he'd be Cy Young caliber. Oh, Christopher Sanchez. Thought he was solid. Didn't think he would be one of the best pitchers in baseball. And you know what? I may give it to Christopher Sanchez yet. But the guy I'm thinking about is a position player. And – the thing with Christopher Sanchez, why I don't think I'm going to be able to give him this award, is we saw flashes last year of him being really, really good in like a big role for the team. So it's hard to say that he's the most surprising. It has been surprising how good he's been. I'm not taking anything away from him. But compared to this guy, well, it's hard to. And Alec Bone probably deserves to be in this conversation as well. But again, it's another guy. He was close to 100 RBIs last year. Uh, he's a guy that's shown this ability in the past, just in short spurts. Most surprising player is going to Edmundo Sosa. When Trey Turner went down, there was a question about moving Bryson Stott over to shortstop. It was, who's going to play there? Will it be Whit Merrifield? That second, Bryson Stott at short. Will Edmundo Sosa be an everyday player? Will the Phillies take a major step back at a very important position with Trey Turner playing very well and hitting very well? And it was an extended absence that Edmundo Sosa – just absolutely dominated for the Philadelphia Phillies. He's been so good this year, and he's gone through stretches where he's looked like the bench player that he is, or maybe not the bench player, but like not Trey Turner. But there were stretches there where he looked like he was a top, top level shortstop in the game. I think that was the first instance of the Philadelphia Phillies getting a guy to step up in a huge role when somebody went down. And I do have to say, I think other players on the team have built on that. You see Edmundo Sosa doing it, and then the next thing you know, okay, well, JT goes down, Garrett Stubbs, Rafael Marchand, it's your turn to step up. Uh, Cody Clemens steps in when guys get injured. I mean, when you have the Brandon Marsh injury, David Dahl just goes on an absolute hot streak to start off his time with the Philadelphia Phillies. Like the Phils have had a lot of guys step up into a lot of big roles, but none more so than in Mundo Sosa. So he gets the most 
surprising. The least surprising, so I guess we'll call it the most on brand with their projection. We're going to go with Zach Wheeler. Who thought any chance this guy was not going to be dominant this year? Like, he's always been dominant. He always will be dominant in a Phillies uniform. He has been on par. You might say, well, I should be Bryce Harper. Could be a bunch of different guys, but we'll we'll have something else for, for Bryce Harper coming up. But to me, it's Zach Wheeler. Like There were some questions about Bryce Harper coming off that season where he, he came back for Tommy John. Does he make this huge step? Does he improve at first base? And uh, he's been really good, but the least surprising is Zach Wheeler because you just expected from get-go him to be really good since he signed that extension, and he has been. So credit to Zach Wheeler, who has been a huge part of this rotation. Let's go with the most disappointing. This is going to be a tough one. It pains me to give this award out, but the most disappointing player on this team, you, you have a couple candidates, minimal amount of candidates because the team's been so good. I know there's someone out there screaming at their screen right now, Taiwan Walker, Taiwan Walker, Taiwan Walker. I will tell you this. I know what a lot of people saw last year in the win-loss column for him, 15 wins. But if you watch the games, you saw the way he got there. He didn't feel like a 15-win pitcher. He didn't feel bad. Like, he wasn't this bad, but he didn't feel, like, dominantly good. Didn't pitch in the postseason. You kind of got a feeling from the organization. They're like, we have some questions about this guy. And he started the season off injured. So, yeah, I, I can't give it to Taiwan Walker. You kind of – did not expect high-level stuff out of him this year, I don't think. I think you expected average to above average, and you didn't get that. But the biggest disappointment so far has been Whit Merrifield. You sign him, you say, okay, he was an all-star last year. He's that mega utility guy that can play anywhere that really adds to the bench depth. And he's kind of been the only guy on the roster that hasn't added to the bench depth, which is funny because he was the sure thing to make this team's depth look so much more attractive. And – He's just flat out, I, I got to be honest, sorry to my guy Wit. he's flat out stunk this year. Now maybe, maybe we'll be in a spot where he hits a hot stretch, he shows you why he's on this team, why the Phillies spent money for him and everything. He holds down his depth role and he plays a big role later on in the season. It's happened before, it can happen again. But uh, yeah, I just, sorry, Whit Merrifield has been easily to me the most disappointing player for the Philadelphia Phillies. Well, let's get it back to the most positive. Let's go to the... Let's give out a Cy Young award, okay? The best pitcher on the Philadelphia Phillies for the first half of the season was Ranger Suarez. I know I just said, well, Zach Wheeler was the least surprising. Ranger Suarez, to me, has been the best pitcher. I know this sounds weird coming off of a game where he gave up six runs to the Miami Marlins. Everybody has a bad day. It happens. Guys get touched up sometimes, and what are you going to do? But his overall season has been out standing. He's been healthy. He's been dominant. He's gone deep into games. He threw a complete game shutout. He's just been like, he's throwing a complete game shutout. Aaron Nola's throwing a complete game shutout. We just saw him for Christopher Sanchez over the weekend. The pitching staff has been dominant, but Ranger Suarez has been leading the way for the Philadelphia Phillies. Unfortunately, I cannot give it to a reliever. We'll go with a reliever next, though. We'll go with the, I guess, is it still the fireman of the year? I think that's what the reliever award used to be called. Uh, you used to be able to win it in MLB The Show. I don't even know, because the Phillies haven't had like a top-level reliever like that since – who, Brad Lidge in 2008, like where you're getting national, national acclaim, and there's no doubt. But the best reliever on the Philadelphia Phillies so far this year, Jeff Hoffman deserves credit. Jose Alvarado deserves credit. But there's one guy who could win this award, and it is Matt Strom, and he deserves to be an all-star for it. And you know what's funny? Matt Strom started as a starter last year because of injuries in the Phillies rotation. And then he gets moved to the bullpen. And people were wondering, okay, well, is he going to be able to transition back to the bullpen role? Fine. And he was really good last year, but he wasn't even as good as he is this year. He has been the best reliever on this team, I think, clearly. And the best part, you should go look up if you have a subscription to The Athletic. Look up a piece from Matt Gelb about Matt Strom and Jeff Hoffman, their throwing partners, and the relationship between those two guys who have been dominant in the bullpen. Uh, we'll give out one more. We'll give out a quirky award, okay? The Heart of the Team Award for the Philadelphia Phillies so far this year. And I know everybody just rolled their eyes and said, here comes the Garrett Stubbs love. You know what? I I'm not going to give it to Garrett Stubbs. Uh, he I think he de facto is. He's a big part of it. But the guy that I'm going to give it to this year, he hasn't had his best season. He's had moments, but he's really, to me, feels like the glue that holds this team together. And that's Brandon Marsh. Kyle Schwarber could have gotten this. 
of course, Stubbs could have gotten this. Any member of the daycare could have honestly won this award in my mind. But Brandon Marsh kind of – he is the balance in this team. Even Alec Bohm and Bryson Stott, they like to mess around, but they have this air of seriousness when they play the game. Brandon Marsh doesn't even have that. This dude is just always having a good time. He's always – but here's why it works. He's always playing at a billion percent, not a hundred percent, not a thousand percent, not a million percent. He goes at a billion percent speed all the time. He'll run through a wall for this team. I'm not selling you he's the best player on the team, but I'm saying that when you look at the like a player that embodies what this Philadelphia Phillies team is, I think behind the scenes and sometimes on the field, it's Brandon Marsh. That's it. The focus has been there this year, but the fun still has to be, and that's why he's winning that award. Uh, I guess finally we'll give out the MVP of the first half of the season for the Philadelphia Phillies, and that is none other than Bryce Aaron Max Harper. (laughs) Who else would it be, guys? Come on. You didn't think I'd wait this long and give out the first half MVP award and not give it to the guy who's an actual MVP contention. It's got to be Bryce. There's no other guy. He's been absolutely dominant. The average is above 300. He's hitting bombs, RBIs. Fielding the ball at first base at a gold glove caliber clip. He's the number one vote getter in the National League for the All-Star team. A lock starter at first base if he's healthy, which we hope he is. I might honestly hope he doesn't play in the All-Star game, and that's a conversation for a different day. But uh, everyone around baseball knows it. This dude, when he comes back from injury, hopefully he'll still be on the heater. But if he plays the rest of the year healthy and at that level, he could lock up his third National League MVP trophy in his career, and it would be very deserving because he is the straw that stirs the drink for this team. Make no mistake, there can be a heart of the team, there could be a most improved player, there could be all this other awards, but without Bryce Harper, this team's ceiling is significantly lower. And you know what's funny? They're without Bryce Harper right now. So as we move on to our next segment, you can let me know in the comments if you have any awards of your own you'd like to give out or if you disagree with any of my choices for those awards that I just ran through. Uh, but the Phils are heading into a potentially really tough stretch of the schedule. Is this considered a gauntlet? And if it is, what are our expectations for this next stretch of Philadelphia Phillies baseball without Bryce Harper? Because I just told you they're ceiling significantly lower without him. We'll get into that coming up as we continue today's episode of Locked on Phillies. First, though, I want to tell you about my friends over at Prize Picks. I should say our friends because they're your friends, too. They're everyone's friends. They're America's number one daily fantasy sports app. They've got over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, you're not playing against any other people or any other players on the app. No, you're, it's just you versus the numbers. I know you're smarter than numbers. Come on, you guys got this. You're smart enough to listen to Locked On Phillies. All you do is you pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. There's a bunch of stuff you can do, a bunch of different sports. I mean, you got baseball, hockey, and uh, basketball just wrapped up, but you could do esports when football rolls around. You could do that. And baseball, like a billion teams play every night. So go ahead and check it out. There's a, mo- a monster amount of money to win. You can win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000. Just like that in a snap. And if you're looking for promotions, they got a bunch of them. Uh, You could have uh, lowering uh, select player stat projections on Tuesdays. On Fridays, if you have a losing lineup, you can get your entry fees back. There's no reason not to download Prize Picks today. But if you needed one more, you download the Prize Picks app today. Use code Locked On MLB. You'll get a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the Prize Picks app. Use code Locked On MLB, and you'll get a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks is the best. You know their logo. All you got to do is pick more or pick less. It's just that easy. Let's also talk about Tax Network USA. They are very, very important to have in your corner if you're having trouble right now with your taxes. We pride ourselves here on Locked on Phillies on getting you the latest news for your team. It might be the offseason, regular season. <clears throat> excuse me. It might be the postseason. Whatever it is, it's a year-round job to keep you updated on the Phillies. And you know what else is year-round? It's collection season. Just because tax season is over doesn't mean the IRS will stop coming after you for unfiled taxes. They can garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, even seize your property. So don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals and tax experts at Tax Network USA go to bat for you. They've got over 14 years of experience, an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, and they've saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. So maybe you owe taxes, 
Maybe you have complicated matters that require tax planning, or maybe you finally hit that parlay this season and you need help correctly filing. Well, whatever the case is, call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. And be sure to mention that Locked On Phillies sent you in at checkout and you'll receive a $250 discount off their services. I think that's the biggest discount we've had from any advertiser at any point during my time here with Locked On Phillies. So go ahead and check out Tax Network USA. Let's look ahead to this schedule now, because with an off day, we have the luxury of being in a position to take a peek ahead. I hate to do this on days where the Phillies play games, but because they're on the way to Chicago right now traveling, uh, let's look forward. We've done this a couple times, but I want to have the debate as to whether or not this is a gauntlet for the Philadelphia Phillies. They start with three games in Chicago against the Cubs. They just had an off day. Guys can rest up. I hardly look at this as a tough series, even with the injuries facing the Phillies. The Cubs are 39 and 46. They're seven games under 500. I'm not looking at that opponent and saying, oh man, you're in big time trouble as far as facing the Cubs is concerned. Like, like no, you're going to face Shota and Managa. So that's going to be a tough game in the second game of that series. Uh, you're, but that's the only like top level arm that you're seeing against the Chicago Cubs. They're pitching solid. Their offense is left a little bit to be desired. The Philadelphia Phillies are capable of beating any team. We'll preview that series tomorrow on our next episode. But, okay, that's not part of a gauntlet. I'm not too worried about that, even though it's three games on the road. Then you go to Atlanta for three games, and here's where it kind of starts, right? The Atlanta Braves have three games against you, and they could really use it. They're 10 games over 500, but in the division right now, the Philadelphia Phillies are still holding an eight-game lead. That lead could be five games by the time you leave Atlanta, or worse, depending on what happens with the series with the Cubs. I'm not here to be all doom and gloom because I don't think that's going to happen. But I will say that the Atlanta series without Harper, Schwarber, and Romuda does scare me a little bit. I just don't want there to be hope down there in Atlanta that they can catch the Phillies or that they have any horse still in the race. I mean, just Recently, Fangraphs put out some projections on the NL East and who's going to win it. And the Phillies have like an 81 plus percent chance to win the division. That's pretty darn good, but that can change quickly if the Phillies start to slide. Still, one series is not a gauntlet make. Then the Phillies come back home. They're playing the Los Angeles Dodgers. So are those six games enough to be considered a gauntlet? Here's what I'd say. Right. I had this argument before I was talking about if you're an Eagles fan, they had a stretch of the schedule last year that was criminally hard. I can't believe the NFL schedule stuff that way. But that's for the locked on birds guys to talk about locked on Eagles. Bottom line is we had a discussion about if there's a gauntlet this year in the Eagles schedule. And I said, "Mm, no, your gut feeling has to be immediately. Yes. You know it when you see it, when you have something that's determined as a really, really tough stretch of the schedule, a.k.a the gauntlet. This to me is two tough series, but it's six games. Like let's say the Philadelphia Phillies lose all six of those games. They won't, but let's say they lose all six of those games. They currently are three and a half games up on the Los Angeles Dodgers. So there's a chance that they could lose all six of those games and still have the best record in the national league and the best record in their division. It's not, Likely that it happens that way, but it's also not likely the Phillies lose all six of those games. So to break it down, I don't think this is too tough of a spot as I look at it. After those games, you have a series with the Oakland Athletics in Philadelphia, so you don't have to get on the road. Then you go to Pittsburgh to play the Pirates. Not a long trip, and that's also post-All-Star break. So the All-Star break being in this stretch really is also what differentiates it. You just have two tough series, and with the lead you've built for yourself in division, you're in a pretty darn good spot. Here's one thing I will say, and I brought it up about the Marlins series, and I'll say the same darn thing about this series with the Cubs because you didn't build momentum in that series against the Marlins. If anything, you lost a little bit of it by splitting the series. And, well, I'm talking about the Marlins series post-injuries. Of course, the injuries were a huge momentum drop-off for the Philadelphia Phillies. But it would really help to be playing good baseball going into the series against the Braves and then subsequently the series against the Dodgers. I would hate to see the Phillies drop two or three in Chicago and then be reeling and pressing when they play the Braves and the pressure gets on you a little bit and you say, hmm, divisional series, lead doesn't look as big as it used to, and you get nervous and then you don't play your best 
and then it's a snowball down the hill effect when you take on the Dodgers. Like that's not where you want to be. You want to take two or three from the Cubs. We'll talk about that tomorrow and how they can do that. But ultimately, I don't think the Phillies are in that tough of a stretch of the schedule. They have one later on in the month, too, that we'll talk about where it's three games against the Guardians and then three games against the New York Yankees. And that's tough, too. Like the month of July is their toughest month. So today, as we sit here on July 1st, this will be probably a make or break month for the Phillies getting the top seed in the National League or winning the NL East. A lot can be determined over the next how many days are in July? 30 days as September, April. 31 days in July. <laughs> Everybody says that in their head. I'm no different just because I have a microphone in front of me. Uh, it's going to be a tough month. And when I look at what the Philadelphia Phillies have in front of them, the number one thing is survive till the All-Star break, hopefully get healthy, hit the ground running again on the backside of that. That's where we're at. So no gauntlet is the official verdict for me. Maybe you disagree. You can let me know in the comments on this video. Tweet at me at Connor Thomas975. You see it down in there in the corner. That's just how I'm feeling about where the Philadelphia Phillies are at right now. And I don't think they're in that bad of a spot. But again, big win yesterday over the Miami Marlins. And that really helped to steady the ship. Coming up, the team might be in a good spot. But there are some individual players who are really in dangerous positions when it comes to their playing time, their role on this team, maybe their position on the team in general. Who are the guys on the hot seat as we draw closer to the trade deadline? We'll get into that coming up as we wrap up today's episode of Locked on Phillies. But guess what I've got to tell you about first, FanDuel. Come on, you know FanDuel, and I love sports. I love them so much I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we're getting fewer games, right? Basketball's wrapped up. Hockey's wrapped up. You got baseball season going on, but you're not getting the same level of sports income or like, I guess, influx as you normally do. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. There's no off season for FanDuel. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers, not just new customers, not first time customers, all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long with FanDuel. You got to go ahead and check them out. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. You might think that's going to the beach. You might think that's traveling. No, hop on FanDuel. Make the most out of it by making some money. FanDuel is an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Go ahead and check out more on FanDuel in the description in the bio of this, or I guess the link in the description, there it is, of this episode. All right, why do you say we wrap this one up with a bit of a hot seat conversation? Now, I want to be very clear about what this means, who's on the hot seat. It's different things for different players. For some guys, it may be their current role on the team. For some guys, it may be their current position on the team. For some guys, it may be, yo, you're going to be either in the minors or gone if you don't pick it up. So who are the players that are trying to prove themselves ahead of the trade deadline? One of the first guys that I think about, is Whit Merrifield. And I had this conversation today off air over at 97.5 The Fanatic talking about Whit Merrifield radio-wise. And actually, you know what? Maybe it was on air. I don't really remember. It was a busy morning with all the Sixers news. Shout out. Follow Locked On Sixers. Big signings for the folks playing uh, round ball here in this city. Nobody calls it round ball. I don't know. I just said that. The Hoops team has got good stuff. But I talked about Whit Merrifield this morning. And the sentiment that I hold is he's going to be on this team till the bitter end or maybe the championship ends, but bitter end as an expression, he's too talented over the course of his career to not have an opportunity for the full year for this team. And also you have an option for next year that you can exercise. You're going to want to see before you make that choice, whether or not you get as enough, like enough data on it. So has Whit Merrifield been good this year? No, I called him the biggest disappointment of the year. He won the most disappointing in the awards ceremony that we had in the first segment of the podcast. But his resume is better than anyone you have on the bench. He's been a multi-time all-star. He led the American League in hits. He is a bona fide pure hitter when he's at his best. Problem is this year, he's been darn near his worst. And he's getting older. So I'm not here to tell you Whit Merrifield's going to like pull out of this skid. But I'm of the camp that he's, you may feel on the hot seat, 
but he's not truly on the hot seat to me because I think the Philadelphia Phillies are going to trust the resume and hope he pulls out of it. He may play a lesser role, right? He may drop down as far as his usage on the bench, but I believe Whit Merrifield is going to continue to be on this team. Cannot option him, does not have options. If he was to be waived, he would have to be clearing waivers and he would not. Some team would pick him up. So that's how I feel on Whit Merrifield. Let's move on to the next guy. Brandon Marsh is in a very interesting spot with the Philadelphia Phillies. This isn't so much being on or off the team. Brandon Marsh is going to be on this baseball team. He deserves to be, and I think he deserves to be an everyday player. But the Phillies just don't seem to feel that way. They've got him platooning. They don't have him facing lefties regularly. And with the needs at the trade deadline being one, maybe two outfielders, well, where does Brandon Marsh slot in? If you go out and get a starting center fielder, well, Brandon Marsh is probably your somewhat regular left fielder, but let's just say you go out and you trade for Luis Robert and Johan Rojas goes in that deal or something. I'm just throwing something out here randomly. And your outfield is now Pache, Merrifield, Marsh, Robert, Castellanos. What exactly do you do in left field when Castellanos is playing every day in right? Robert would play every day in center. This is just an example to show you how tight left field would be. Oh, and how could I forget David Dahl, who I haven't brought up? Left field could be Marsh, it could be Pache, it could be David Dahl, it could be Merrifield, it could be Heck Schwarber when he's healthy. Now he should probably not go out there at all anymore this year because he got hurt out there only in like his third game of the year in the field. But it gets busy. And it would be great for Brandon Marsh to step up and take control of that position. But if he does not, he's not going to see that much playing time the rest of the way. He will play, but he will play on a rotational basis. And it could be more than just a platoon. To me, a platoon is two players. This could be like a three-man rotation. Could be more than that. And I'm sure he's feeling the pressure to produce because that's going to allow him to become a major part of a great team. If not, he could get lost in the shuffle. I think it's silly, but I do think it's how the Philadelphia Phillies feel. If I was a betting man, I would say that Brandon Marsh is going to continue in a platoon system in left field and that the Phillies will do something in center. But we'll see how that goes. Another guy in the outfield. It's basically all outfielders. I don't think there's anyone uh, in the infield that is on the hot seat. Let's do this real quick. Some people might say, oh, Garrett Stubbs, because Raphael Marshawn has come up and he's looked serviceable as a backup catcher. Can you really say, like honestly, can you look me in the eyes right now and say that Raphael Marshawn has been drastically better than Garrett Stubbs? I, I just I don't think you can say that with any type of certainty. And I've long been in the camp since this injury happened to JT Romuto, that Marshan would have to be such a clear upgrade over Garrett Stubbs to, to deserve to stay on the scene, to deserve to stay on the team in favor of Garrett Stubbs. Like, I, I just don't think that's realistic. Uh, Marshan's batting 219. Garrett Stubbs right now, 216. They're essentially the same player, and the Phillies have shown you they don't want to upset the status quo. Do you think this locker room's better with Garrett Stubbs in it? Okay, correct. They are. Do you think this team is better with Garrett Stubbs on it than Raphael Marchand? I think it's a wash, and that's why he's not on the hot seat. So take that out of the equation. But one more guy that's on the hot seat in the outfield, and I think the pitching staff is pretty settled. The final spot in the rotation is kind of iffy, but that's a regular season deal, so I'm not too worried about that. The bullpen's pretty settled. They'll add somebody, but I'm not to the point of where I know who's going to be the guy that takes the bullet for adding an arm that will get either sent down. It'll probably be – Whoever has options, I think Jose Ruiz might have some options, but Michael Mercado definitely has options. He might get sent down when this team gets healthier. Bottom line is the last guy I want to talk about is Johan Rojas. Now, Rojas got called up out of necessity after the Harper injury and the Schwarber injury, and he was solid in that series against the Miami Marlins. Had a great moment where he had a hustle double that nobody saw coming, not even the outfield of the Miami Marlins. Stole third, uh, found a way home. Like he was just electric in those two minutes of gameplay and the base running was significantly better than what you've seen from him this year. And that was one of the knocks on him. So you can tell he's feeling the pressure and also that he's responding to it properly. And I don't think he wants to go back to Lehigh. I don't think that guy wants to end up back on the iron pigs, all due respect to the iron pigs, but Johan Rojas wants to be competing with the major league team. And he's got an opportunity by default because of injuries to show that once again, after getting sent down. He's going to have to show something very, very special in a very, very short period of time. Is that possible? Sure. Is it likely? 
this is the one that I see as the least likely, especially considering the Phillies are going to make a trade for an outfield piece. I firmly believe it. I don't think that Rojas has done enough early on with his bigger stretch of the season to prove it to show the Phillies that they're fine in the outfield. And I think there's other issues. Christian Pache is definitely on the hot seat, but that's not even surprising. He just hasn't hit. And I don't know. He's in the same position as Rojas. Those are guys that it's more likely than not that their role is either diminished or completely gone by the backside of the trade deadline. So there you have it. And a little update on where player standing is with the club. And those are the only two guys that I just talked about, Rojas and Pache. And I guess David Dahl as well, but I don't even like he's a mercenary at this point. I don't think anyone's crying for David Dahl if he ends up being traded or waived or whatever. He is huge in a relief role in the outfield, but kind of is what it is. We knew that when he signed a minor league deal. Uh, but that's your update on where I think these players stand and what the future could hold for them tomorrow. We've got a preview of the series with the Chicago Cubs, a lot to break into. I'm also going to be talking on 97.5 The Fanatic with Boog Shambi, who is the play-by-play -play announcer of the Cubs. So I'll pull some tidbits from that interview for you and share those with you in tomorrow's episode as well. You're going to want to check in on that. Once again, we come to you as part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing to the YouTube, all that great stuff. And I'll talk to you next time on the next episode of Locked On Phillies.